So I have here a pack of cards. You can use any deck of cards. The cards can be shuffled. You can live your life and do it your way. Now, this is one of those tricks that has been, um, this trick has been absolutely obsessing me for the last several weeks. Um, and uh, I'm going to try it out tonight for you right here. Now, this is one of those tricks that's designed, as they all are, to be done with real people right in front of us. So we're going to start with Mr. Adam Grace. I'm going to have Adam Grace help me. And had you been here, I would ask you, Adam, to cut off less Less than half the deck so that there's room for two other people to play. But since I want to make it totally fair, because this is one of those tricks that if you don't know how fair it is, it really don't mean, uh, it don't mean a thing if you don't got that swing. So Adam, do you want a, a really small packet, a medium sized packet or a biggish packet? I'm going to give you a chance to modify that because normally if you were here, you just cut. And it would I want you to cut thin to win. Cut thin to win. I'm going to not look at your cards. Now, do you want me to add some cards or take some cards away? Why don't you add a few? Make it a little thicker. Yeah. You tell me, well, not going to respond to that. Tell me when uh, you're happy. That, that's good. Right there. Yeah, right, right there. there? Yeah. All right. So take a look at the card. I'm really not going to know what the card is. And I have to tell you, that fills me with, I think card magicians would call it dread. Take a look at the card. Make sure okay. you know it. Everyone it. who uh, wants to sympathize with Adam, go ahead and remember that card. Adam, had you uh, been here, I would ask you to take that uh, card and hold it against your chest, not to show it to anyone. You would never have to tell anyone or share what it is. I'm going to get to participate too, so that's exciting. I get to see what this one is. Uh, Alex, would you go ahead and help me by remembering this one on the audience's behalf? I will indeed. Yeah, I've got, got it. it. Okay, sure. and now we're going to have uh, Sean Mullins, if you will help me, if you would, sir. Uh, say stop, if you would, uh, actually, anytime. Stop. There? Yes. Look at the card. Got it. Had you been here, I would have you hold that against your breast. You would never have to show it to a single soul. Okay, oh, so just to make this really clear, we would have Adam take his card. He would look at it a final time. He would drop it. In the deck, I would have the King of Diamonds. Sean, got it? Yep. So everyone would have to agree that there's no way I could know what your cards are and no way I could know where your cards are in this deck. Would you say that that is fair? Yes. Yes, seems, yes. seems that's all true, yeah. It seems that is all true, unless I have some weird kind of closed circuit experience happening here. We're going to give these cards a shuffle right? We're going to give these cards a cut. And I'm going to tell you that the first time I saw a magician do the trick I'm about to show you, I was incredulous. In fact, I did something that I rarely do. I stood up and I challenged him, right? I challenged him by removing my wallet and saying to him, if you can do what you say you're going to do, you can have everything that I brought with me here tonight. All of it, everything. And what he told me next, I will never forget. He told me that magic is about taking people on an incredible journey so that people who are separate, like us, can come together and experience magic. And so what he said he was going to do was take those three cards. And even though they're in different parts of the deck, and even though he doesn't know what they are, and even though he doesn't know where they are, he was going to do one impossible move and make those cards come together. That's what I'm going to try and do now. With one magic move, <laughs> I'm going to try and make those cards come together. Adam, you've got a card in mind. Sean, yep. you've got a card in mind. Alex, you have a card in mind. Everybody at home has a card in mind. First person to see one of your cards, go ahead and call out stop, and we will have the big denouement. King, four, five, six, two, three. Stop me when you see it. That's not a king of diamonds. Mark says slow down a little bit, but I'm have a feeling they're not in there because I haven't seen mine yet. Yeah, me neither. I was thinking I've been I've been flim flammed. They're they're not in there. Well, that's interesting. No. no, they're gone. Because not only did I make those cards come together, but I actually sent them on an incredible journey. No. How can it be? How can it be? How can it be? <laughs> Man, that's a tough, tough to get into there. There's my wallet. And inside 
my sealed compartment in this wallet, I don't have a license. I have three playing cards. What? <laughs> nice. For the first time, Mr. Adam Grace, what was the name of your card? Mine was the Nine of Hearts. <laughs> the there it is. Yep. Uh, yeah. Two of clubs. <laughs> uh, King of Diamonds, yeah. <laughs> Bravo. What a killer, uh, dude. Nice. So it's very rare that I actually decide to do a new trick, that uh, a world premiere trick on a Conjurer community. But, you know, this is called Our Favorite Tricks, and this is the one that's been obsessing me the most. And there's so much in this trick to talk about that uh, you can use. You'll find something for everybody within this one trick. So can, can I just say for a moment that you got so many ones on that? Like, it's like one city over here. I felt like I was coming up at our member mastermind for my first hot seat because I was doing a brand new trick. <laughs> Traditionally, well, whenever you, I do a trick for the first time, it's like. <laughs> well, you did it. You did it flawless. I would say, wouldn't you guys all agree? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's a cool trick, and there's a lot of stuff in it, and it's you know, it's kind of it's it wouldn't be the first card to wallet I would recommend you do if you do the card to wallet. That's why we have the autopilot card to pocket, and I highly suggest that if you like this effect, you go check that out because it's where we talk a lot about exactly the card to wallet that you want to do first, and it's got an in-depth uh, tutorial on all the elements that you would need to palm a card and all that stuff. But Adam, did you see that conversation that was on Facebook just the other day? Uh, helped lift packets and turn it into something. That, uh, so now, you, who wants to see the trick? Because there's actually a lot oh, of yeah, stuff. You, you get trick. So this trick uh, is starts with a Jerry Sadowitz idea from his book, Cut Controls. And uh, he was figured out a way to take the free cut principle, uh, which normally uses many, many packets, and turn it into something that is reasonably direct and powerful. This is a middle. This is something I would do as a middle or an encore or any time when I didn't have a pen and I wanted to create a situation where a card to wallet might be uh, really, really strong um, without... Uh, without you know signing cards and stuff like that so all you need to do is have a crimp at the 26th card of a 52 card deck um i'm using a breather crimp which means i took a card and i went like that 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 until i had a big old honking x in it and frankly when i'm going to do this kind of magic folks you can't see but it's pretty big it's pretty dang huge. Hopefully if I turn around, you can see it's, I can see it glinting off the light from here. See how you can see that X? I do not want to miss it. And the work will get softer and softer. And the last thing I want to think about is whether or not I got it. Okay. Especially for this trick, because I'm almost breaking my one of my own rules here. I actually did a Pharaoh because it was methodologically necessary, which I did for Mark. Uh, based on a request of his a couple weeks ago. So assuming that that card's the 26, you have everything you need to get going. You have the first person cut off a card from the top packet and just make sure that they cut less than half the cards. It makes perfect sense because you're going to cut the three cards. And I'm just going to go ahead and pull an Alex here and turn the, that face up so no one has to remember anything. You can see what's happening, right? And then you cut a card for yourself. And of course that, big surprise, notice I had a big surprise. I went, oh, I gotta remember my card. And then immediately have someone else remember it on behalf of the spectator because now it becomes a real selection too, okay? So um, I will go ahead and, of course the method for this trick is the kind of method where you may find that uh, turning cards face up is not a good idea when you're practicing it. So now for the third card, you have that third person cut anywhere. I would really make a big deal about their freedom here, their absolute freedom here. I'm gonna turn this one face up so that everyone can see. So this is a really remarkable, nasty, devious principle. Because what happens is, now remember, you have your spectators, these cards are up against their breasts, like so. They don't have to tell them to anyone. They never even have to say what they are. So you have Adam take his packet and place it on top. And everyone focuses on that. And so no one sees you bring the bottom card of your half to the top. Okay? So the method that I prefer is a pass in this case. Um, but all that cover you're going to have, you can push over that bottom card and just bring it to the top. 
don't try and make it invisible, okay? You've got a wonderful covered moment where you're having this person put back. Now, square the cards, square the cards. You can do it again, twice, if you need to while they're doing that. No one's going to see it. As Soon as they drop it back, you take a quick peek and you go, okay, King of Diamonds. It's a little missed call there. That changes the position of that card. And Alex drops his card, his pack on top, which he's been here. So no one knows what those two cards are. No one could possibly know. Now check this out. You have actually put your cards in this position. And because of that exact uh, sequence where the first packet off is the first packet back, Adam cut off first, then me, then Sean, then I have Adam place his back, then me, then Sean. That reverses them. They are now precisely 26 cards apart from each other. And to be specific, one Pharaoh at halfway in the deck is gonna put that card in between those two cards. Which means that after you do this, you de give the deck one. And of course, exactly where the reverse cards are is where the Pharaoh hicked up, if that's not a term. It could be. And this is something that John Thompson uh, reminded me of just last month, and I think it's worth sharing, is that Edward Marlowe, he said one of his favorite Edward Marlowe ideas is that after a Pharaoh, he turned the cards like this, and that's when you mention to the audience that you're gonna give them a shuffle. They don't remember how you shuffled the cards, they just remember that picture of a clean, fair shuffle. That's the kind of thing that people who are obsessed with learning the fair shuffle have Wow, that is a huge tip. I have never heard that before. Definitely. That is great. That's awesome. And, and it was a game changer for me, and it's the kind of thing that made me feel like doing this trick, frankly. So now you've got three cards together, and the bottom one is crimped, okay? Which means you can cut these cards to the top. Okay, so what Jerry Sadowitz did to do his, and his, his was a card to wallet as well, but you can do this as a card under glass. You can do whatever you want with these. You can actually just reverse them in the pack now using one of a dozen methods. What Jerry did was he did a cut, a top palm in the act of a cut. And then he went into his wallet. Now I am a big fan for cards to wallet of using bottom palms. Watch the autopilot card to pocket for the complete beginning tutorial on this. We did a whole hour on it and you wanna see it if you wanna work on this topic. So here's what I did though, and I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna debut for the first time, a world premiere slight called the undercut bottom palm, which is based on Altman's double undercut bottom palm, okay? Um, and here's what happens. I pick up at my break, right there, and as I go, I said I gave the cards a, a shuffle, and then I pick up at the break, and I riffle off my three cards, Our and now I'm going to give double cut. undercut bottom palm. And after you riffle off those three, I stick a finger in, and I seesaw like that. And now, as I do this double, this undercut action, which looks like that, this is what happens. All I do is I, this is the action normally, right? You're coming away. So all I'm doing is I'm pressing that packet against my right thumb. And as I'm doing that, I extend my first finger and that angles the packet over to the right. So I'll do that for you in real time so you can see what it looks like and I'll give them a cut. And so, all three cards are together and palmed. I think it's pretty awesome. I've been working on this a long time. You can do it from a lot of different situations. Um, what else can I tell you about it? You riffle off one, two, three, one more time. You seesaw so that that turns into that. And then, in, as you swing, you extend that first finger, the packet moves over in between the second and, right, uh, second and third finger of the right hand, looks like this. And then, as you do, and this is what makes the double undercut bottom palm of Altman so wonderful, is that it's a palm for people that can't palm. Because you take the cards, you bring them up to the, in the undercut position, and look at your position of your hand, friends. All you have to do is cut the cards and it delivers that packet directly into bottom palm position. So it doesn't look like you could have possibly done anything. And of course, in this instance, I was so happy 
Because look, you can cut those cards to the top and then palm by any way you can. But I was happy to have a palm because of this incredible sort of sequence that didn't have any extra moves in it. Because in this one situation, once I pull out the wallet, everybody knows where we're going. So to be able to pull that wallet out with that kind of immediacy really to cool. me is important if you want to mess around with tricks like this. <clears throat> Go ahead, Alex. Can I, can I ask you for a favor? Would you mind doing that move one more time? And then I, uh, before you do it, I have a question about it. When you uh, cant those cards to the side, how close is that to uh, your side glide when you, do, when you are canting those cards for the side glide? Is it, is it the same? <laughs> Same exact position. So when we okay. do a bottom palm, whether it's with one card, and you'll learn how to do this with the autopilot card to pocket. And I highly suggest you watch that because in that you do the glide and that puts the card into position. And this is a really easy application. The card stays in, you pulling the wallet out, they're still looking at the card. It's really magical, very, very commercial. It's where I recommend you start. But that's the position. So when you have three cards at the bottom, you would do something like that which I've discovered is reasonably hard for students to learn. That takes some time. In this situation, you're getting into that same position in the act of one cut with no extra moves. That was so sweet. So sweet. Thank you. That's really great. All right. So um, we'll be exploring different ways to do the undercut bottom palm in uh, other times and shows that are, you know, where we don't have actually incredible miracles of mind reading and, and easy to do card magic. And I want to thank everyone for uh, being patient with me while I geeked out a little bit tonight. Normally I wouldn't uh, put a Pharaoh and a bottom palm in a conjure community trick, but uh, it's the holidays. So oh, thank you for showing us that. That was Happy a great holidays. Let's give it. And thankfully today's a different kind of holiday. So we can actually talk about anything y'all want. You know, Alex, when you mentioned three cards to pocket, I totally forgot that this was that Sadowitz, that wonderful Sadowitz control. It's really great. It's really great. I had so much fun catching up with that and watching it again. And I knew everyone else would love it too, because it's just solid technique that's fun to do and fun to practice. And you know, that's, that's sort of what we love in good card magic, right? It's gotta be fun to perform, fun to practice, cool moves, just a good uh, trick. It's just do you, great. Do you, ha do you happen to have a surface so that if I were to talk you through something, people would be able to see your surface because the way I'm uh, set up right now, it'd be hard to get my surface in view. If you give me two minutes, I can. I'll, let me go dark and I'll, I'll set it up real quick, yeah. yeah. Okay, because I can set this up. So, so one of the things that I think is really special about this, guys, is, and I said this at the beginning, that you know, lots of times when we do a card to impossible location or we do a card to wallet or lemon or whatever, the signature is the thing. Right. Uh, you know, and there's plenty of good ways to do it. As long as you can make the card look like it's disappearing pretty well, there's pretty good ways to do it with, without a, a, a duplicate, right. Without a signature. But what's nice about this, the reason that this is a great way to do a non signature type card to wallet is because the selection procedure is so free that you can spread the cards you could even have them shuffled if you could uh, quickly get a crimped card to the center of the deck. And if anyone wants to ask about that, we'll go ahead and answer it. But you can take that shuffled deck and you can show all the cards are different and then have people look at those cards in such a clean, free way that it, it, it's such a clean, free selection that it's actually impossible for you to know which cards they would pick and get them into your wallet. Right. So we'll talk about that. I think we'll go through it again with the uh, table in front of Alex so that everyone can see exactly what I mean. Because you got to remember, people are cutting the deck anywhere they want. They're the only ones seeing the card. Right. They could spread the cards in front of them and see that they're all different. But just remember that card. So it's really impossible that you could know what it is. It's really impossible that you could do it with duplicates. There's no force that looks that good because it's not a force. It's one of those rare situations you know, because there's a lot of forces, tricks that look like forces, but they're, or they would be forces, but they're, look like they're not forces, but they would be different kinds of forces, mathematical forces, name 10 and between a number between 10 and 20, all that kind of stuff. It's a force, right? It doesn't feel like a force, but you're forcing that card. In this case, they're really taking two freely selected cards and it feels uh, impossible. And so I wouldn't, 
very rarely do I do a Pharaoh because of Pharaoh mechanics and a trick, but this is an example where you really get something that you can't get any other way. So Alex, if you would set this up, we'll, we'll go through it again and, and use this opportunity while you're here in chat to go ahead and ask us for more detail on any of these items. We're gonna go through the whole thing again right now. Alex, would you just go ahead and take your King of Diamonds and crimp it? And we'll just talk quickly about how to do that so that everybody- And I'm crimping honestly, so that it's face down? Uh, yeah, exactly. Just, just like we would do uh, in the other configurations you and the I were- Regular old reverse on. breather crimp. Right, and so if you have a, rever a breather crimped card in the deck, We'll quickly talk about how you could really make a thing out of this. If you wanted to make this into an encore, you would definitely have the people shuffle the cards first. Now, of course, you could palm out that card while they do it, but there's no need to because it's a breather crimp, right? So Alex, go ahead and, and shuffle that breather crimp into the deck. And so you remember while you're doing this, you're letting the people look at the cards. You're making sure they know all the cards are different because you're really doing this under challenge conditions. And those challenge conditions are what really allow you to, to end up with something that's that clean and wonderful. <clears throat> so assuming that they have given those cards a good shuffle and a good mix and everyone is absolutely uh, convinced about that, you want to do your best Pharaoh check. This is a good old Pharaoh check. If you're trying to cut for 26 and you'll know before you Pharaoh the cards whether you've got it or whether you're one off or whether you're two off like so. So I just found out that I was one off and in this wonderful situation, maybe two. You wanna have 52 cards, friends, that's important. When I do that Pharaoh check, do I want that king on the bottom? No, you're just doing the Pharaoh check to make sure that you have 26 and 26. Oh, and okay. You wanna Put this. Put the half with the with the crimped card on top. Okay. Now you've got that card is at twenty six and you're ready to go and you're done. So now Alex, go ahead and and spread the cards on the table. And everybody, if you want to set up your cards to do this, just bend the hell out of one card uh, in any way you want and make sure it's twenty six from the top. And there's only fifty two cards. Now square them up. Now, what's going to happen? Did you put a big X on it or just the X? No, the it's, it's got so much. I, I need that crimp so big that it's like floating. <laughs> so I asked the person on my left to cut the cards off and play, and, and he's on my left, and then the person on my right, and then you're going to have them replaced in, in opposite order. So have the first person go ahead and cut off some cards from above half the cards and, and show them to everybody. That's, but that person doesn't show them to everybody. They just cut them and look at them and they place them over there. That's packet A, right? Now you say, I'll take one, and you cut to the crimp. That's why I check, because I want to make sure I got my crimp, right? And I say, you can see it. I'll have one too. We're all in this together. And you place that there, right? And then, go, and that's yours. So go ahead and place that center packet forward, the original of Talon, and place your packet. Well, that's in your hand, so you just oh, keep that there. Okay. Is that the packet you cut off? This is what I cut off. Perfect. You keep that in your left hand dealing position so you know, right? And now you have that second person cut off any number of cards remaining and they take a look at it. Now that's important because while they're doing that, you can turn your back and say, I won't look. And while you're doing that, you turn your back and say, I won't look. You can literally bring your card to the top of your packet. Now, of course, you can do a pass or a side steal, but really, if you turn your back and say, I won't look, it's such an easy matter just to take it off and put it on top, right? So that's already over and, and they've actually taken off their card and looked at it, right? And so I'm gonna turn them face up just for my own sake. And of course, uh, there's every bit of a possibility that I'll have this backwards. So now you go ahead and have the, the A packet replaced on top of the deck. Or, uh, yeah, because that's the original top of the deck is going down first. That was the first one cut off. And that's going to? On top of the cards on the table. How do I know that, that I'm getting that card again? Do I put the crimp down there? No, your crimp is on your packet. That's why this is so great. 
Okay. Right, they, they literally the first packet cut oh, off. Oh, right, because we're top. cutting twenty. Okay, okay, I'm with you. I'm yeah. with you again. It's All the right. kind of thing you'll have to do it several times before the mathematics of it begin to tangle. Right. And you go, oh, it's magic. Then you take yours, you miss call, you go king of diamonds because yours is already on top, and you drop those on top. And then the last person takes one last look at their card, and drops those on top of all. Okay, and that was in this case the five of hearts. All right, so that's going back. That's right. Okay. Now you do one perfect out pharaoh, right? And now you're going to have a crimp, and three cards above that crimp, I, I reverse the other two. The crimp and the two above it are the selections. That's the Satowitz control. Okay, hang on. I'm almost, almost there. One out pharaoh. Oops. And of course, when you're on video doing a webinar, an yeah. will yeah, always no, no pressure on that Pharaoh shuffle, huh? All right, so we right. got it. And now you're saying so that on either side of that crimp. No, the, the crimp is the lowermost card of the two of the three. Yeah, so there's, there's the crimp. And then the two cards above it are. There's the four and the five of hearts. There it is. It worked. That's Did right. What supposed to do. Okay. Okay. So, so just to give you all, I mean, so it's pretty dang amazing, right? Because if you wanted to. I'm you amazed could, right now just by that. <laughs> you could cut those cards to the bottom and palm them by your favorite method. Uh, we have a little more time here. So I think, I think what Sadowitz did, and this is the kind of thing that I, I would love to do if I liked right hand palms, but that's what Sadowitz was saying to do. So what Sadowitz is doing is he's cutting to the crimp, he's getting three cards, and as he's, and I'm gonna expose this now, he's cutting to the table, and as he's coming back to grab those cards, he's palming those off. Wow. So of course, Sadowitz bold, huh? is totally a beast, right? Yeah. Sadowitz is totally a beast. We'll make a note to discuss the different, we'll to talk about pharaohs when, when we're done here in a second. So that's what Sadowitz did. Um, I happen to favor, when I really want to go for it, I happen to favor, maybe it's because I, I do magic right-handed, but I'm a left-handed person, but I really do love very much the method that I gave you. You could also cut the crimp to the bottom and then run, shuffle the cards and run the last few, right? And then palm off the cards from the top that way. So you really have a lot of freedom at this point because it's impossible, right? What I like to do, of course, is that undercut palm, undercut palm as I taught it, okay? Which looks like this. I, I go one, two, three, and now everything's on its side. And I'm grabbing the cards above the break between my thumb and my first finger. And I'm in that, and the action, just remember to everybody, the action is gonna look like this, so it only looks like the exact action of an undercut. But what's happening in that action of the undercut is I'm rotating the whole group down one notch on my right thumb, like this. I'm just turning my left hand clockwise, one notch. And when I say one notch, I mean so the corner of it is technically between the first finger and the second finger. So it looks like that. So as I do this, that's the action. There's absolutely nothing to see. And those cards are jogged. And doing this on the diagonal really helps. Then you go into your undercut. That undercut opens your hands. You slide those in. And as you push them forward like that, what you do is, and, and this is important, tilt your hand. Twist your right hand counterclockwise like the thumb is a pivot post, like that. So what you're doing is you're bringing those cards parallel to the palm, right? So that third finger at the joint hits that corner. The back corner gets jammed very close to the fork of the thumb. And as you square it up, you're in this beautiful left hand palm position, which is gonna feel a little weird to you at first, because those cards seem to be sitting on top of those cards in the palm. But notice how that looks in real life. So if I were gonna show this to you top speed so you could really just see what it looks like when you really do it, it looks like you cut the cards, you place the deck down, it's over. 
at that point, you can relax, you can have them shuffle the cards, you can wait, there's no need to go right to your pocket. Or because you're so clean, you can just jam the cards in your wallet, pull the wallet out, there's still every reason to believe nothing has happened here. So if you think about it, they saw all the cards were different, they shuffled the cards, they cleanly cut cards that you couldn't have possibly controlled, they could have still spread the cards to see they were all different, no one could know what their card is, they put them back cleanly. You give the cards one shuffle and a cut. You put the deck down, you pull out the wallet, you say, now we're going to do a trick. Because everything was so beautifully covered, there's no reason to believe that you started yet, which means there's a, 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 a level of faith that you would normally want to have the wallet out and still have the selections in view. But in this case, the selections still are in view because of how you've gotten them into position. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? Wow, we got forward. Michael Sproul made a little forward movement on the palm. I think, Adam, we have another five to seven minutes where if anyone would like any clarification on this palm, we have the time to do it and help. Give us a one if you would like. Um, I said, Newell, that you could palm it in, but then I suggested that all you do is you cut the crimp to the bottom. We're going to talk about the shuffle. Uh, you cut, I, there was still time for that. When I gave the five to seven minutes for the palm, there's still time for the pharaoh. You cut the crimp to the bottom. You do a pharaoh check. Make sure that there's 26 in each half. And then cut the half with the, with the crimp at the bottom to the top. So it's the 26th card down or the 27th from the face. Okay? Um, that's, that's a really great way to do it right? Or, of course, if there is no crimp, you can do the pharaoh check, keep a break between the packets, crimp the bottom card, and then cut at that break, right? So you don't even have to have the crimp beforehand, but I'm trying to teach things with the least amount of work in under fire as humanly possible. So one thing that will help you all is if you take that third finger, look at this palm position, a, often we think about palming positions as being flat in the palm, but I don't do that, okay? I actually like to have that third, third finger right there and bring that corner as close up to the fork of the thumb as possible and then press it down in there. That's how it's gonna work. So you notice that if you're in that position, friends, look at this, if I just press down, that corner gets caught automatically. That's essentially how it works. So the third finger is going to contact there. This is going to be there. The deck's going to be on top of it, and you're going to push down like that, right? And you'll notice that there may be a little baby corner sticking out there. Don't worry about it because you've got your whole fourth finger free. So it's totally deceptive in real life, okay? Okay. Hold on one second, folks. Uh, because of the quarantine, I have to shut the door to another room. One second. Now, I know that feeling, shutting the door to another, but just remember, anytime one door closes, another door opens. <laughs> trying to mute it over here. We have a guy outside doing the lawn. <laughs> it's the same kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think the whole world has moved to uh, working indoors, so we're all experiencing what we here at Conjure Community have known for years. It's hard. So work. much family. So <laughs> much family. So... So just now that you've had that little tip, all you're doing is you're lifting up, you're in this first action, you're swinging that down so it's on an angle. And then as you're bringing these together, at this moment, that's where you are. But if you just move the hand, the right hand up to the cards and rotate a little bit as you're coming up, it, it, it isn't seen at all, it's covered completely by the squaring action, that puts you in the position I just uh, gave you, which means that the deck is here, and all you have to do is set the deck down in your hand, keep the first finger at the front of the deck, and unlike the top palm, you don't have to worry about how big your hands are or anything like that. You can hand these out at your leisure and move forward. So, you know, you've probably seen me teach it as a double undercut from the top, uh, but I like it very much from the middle in one cut as well. Can you, can you do that one more time, get the break and show us how you're getting ready before you, right before you do the palm one more time. 
Yeah. So remember, you've got that break at the crimp. So you do have to seem to riffle a little bit. So it's helpful because you have that break, but no one knows it. It should look a little bit like you're riffling up to halfway before you cut, right? But instead of just cutting, you just put a little swing in the action. Now you'll see a bigger movement covers a smaller movement. So you'll see that that swing is absolutely imperceptible. And that's the position you're in. And then from here, all you're doing is tilting the deck up. So look, this is the deck and you're pushing this together, but you're actually bringing the deck to there as you're doing it. Which means that the card is completely even with the angled card and jigged a little to the left of that, of the deck, of, of the palmed card. So you're there and you press down as I showed you before, and those cards lock into place, right? Very helpful to start by working out your palm position beforehand and then reverse engineering. Because if you get comfortable with this palm position so close to that thumb and that pinky, you're gonna realize you have a lot of space here that you probably didn't know you have, and it's gonna make it easier to learn how to palm. If we could give an award for most, I, I think most used slight that you've ever taught, that it would be the autopilot palm. Like, in fact, used so much now in my personal life, I actually do it while, while, I'm, while I'm doing card tricks, I'll do it just when I'm not even gonna palm a card. I just, my hands automatically start doing it, even though it's not part of the trick. It's so automatic. I think that's why it's called all the, you know, but, but the point is, it's a great, this is a great palm. And it's the kind of palm that any of you guys who've ever attempted top palms and you just don't feel comfortable with, this, this, is, this is the one. This is the one you should stick with. And the, the way I did it for years was in, in, as the Altman double undercut bottom palm, which you, know, you find is the exact same thing placed into an actual double undercut. So it's one of those palms you can do while the Pope and his buddy who runs a casino are watching you at the same time uh, without nerves, right? Because it's just so well covered. So if you're doing the double undercut, you cut the first cards over, and as you put the first ones back, that's when you put that nice big angle in, right? So you leave the deck angled a little bit to the left. Then when you undercut, now you're in that same position you were just in before. So this is exactly where I got you in one cut, right? And that's where you are in the second half of your double undercut. You open those fingers up, you tilt the deck as you're doing it and pushing that flush. And I really exposed it there so you can see it. But it is money in the bank. It's a very, very reliable thing. And that's so, the way you do this trick without pharaohs. If you're just going to do three controls and then you just control them to the bottom and palm, you just do that double undercut bottom palm. Yeah. Or you do one of those, uh, one of those multiple shifts that leaves the cards in the center. And then you can go right into that palm from there. You know, there's a lot of those, uh, lot, a lot of multiple shifts leaves the cards together in the center someplace. So in a case like that, there's no reason to, the only reason uh, is if you just can have a bottom palm, you could always just bring them to the bottom and then do whichever version of these palms you like to do from the bottom. You know, uh, the autopilot, I think, uses one card and glides it there and then teaches you to go in from that. And that's what our link to the autopilot card to pocket does. And then as a multiple, all you would do is a, a mild variation is as you place the cards into your right hand, I, I do the pivot. So as I'm coming over here like that, I turn the deck uh, counterclockwise as I come over here and then come back as I gesture there. So it's totally built for stuff like the Traveler's Chad. Okay. So we have a few minutes to talk about the Pharaoh if you guys would like. It sounds like there's a, uh, an upwelling of interest in the, in the Pharaoh shuffle. So first of all, just to be clear, an out pharaoh leaves the card on top in the same position. So the top card stays top. Any of you who've played with Mnemonica will realize that you've got the black uh, spades 
or the black aces at the top and the bottom of the deck. And that the four Pharaoh shuffles you have to do as the first part of getting into Mnemonica after you start in Spanish New Deck Order keeps them at the top and bottom of the deck. And they're at the top and bottom of the deck in the stay stack, right? That, that's in, at the core of Mnemonica, right? So it's a good mnemonic way to remember. The out Pharaoh keeps the top card on top. An in Pharaoh puts the 26th card or the other half card on top and buries the top card of the deck. Right? So the easiest way to think about it is, say you have four aces on top of the deck. The best way I think to think about simple Pharaoh mechanics is this. If you have four aces on top of the deck, and I guess we used to know this as the Browie Poker Deal, if you do an in Pharaoh, that doubles the position of every card. So now I can deal those aces to me and they will be in a heads up game, they'll come to me. And the in Pharaoh doubles them again. So now I, they will come to me in a four handed game. If I ask you who you want to win, one, two, three, or four, you know, uh, or me, you, 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 or me, if they say, uh, I want you to win, I would take the top three cards and lose them. And now you'll get all the aces, right? So that's the Browie poker deal. And so that's in Pharaohs. The way you think about out Pharaohs is it takes a card at any position and doubles it minus one. Okay. So a fun game I used to play was, was take a card that's anywhere in the deck, two, three, whatever, four, any number at the top, and how to use Pharaohs to get it as close to another number as possible. So say I have, it's a little bit like one of these uh, cases doubling, right? What's, how do you double, uh, how quickly can we double the curve on this uh, five of spades? So say this five of spades is the third card in the deck. Alex, let's just name a number near the middle of the deck. Uh, 23. Okay, so I would start by taking the third card and I would doing an in Pharaoh and that would make it the sixth card, right? Then I would do another, and that would make it the 12th card, right? And then if I did an out Pharaoh, that would be the 24th card minus one, and now that card would be the 23rd card. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and there it is. So it's a simple game you can play to bring a card to that position. So when you get comfortable with your Pharaoh shuffle, you can take a look at any card near the top of the deck and Pharaoh it right up to very close to 26 and maybe just drop a card off or two if you have to in a quick shuffle. Does that understand, help understand the basic difference between the two? Now that still doesn't get us doing it, right? So- Whole other thing. And doing it is one of those things that we, we try and give you a tip or two whenever it comes up because truthfully, it takes some time to learn. Um, it's important to understand that the Pharaoh shuffle wasn't really even designed to be done with perfect cuts and perfect shuffles. Or, uh, it was designed to be able to get a stack of cards together in the middle where it's easy. So it doesn't really matter if you've got the right number it doesn't really matter if the top or bottom goes well, as long as the cards near the crimp in the middle that you're trying to stack go well, you've got everything you need. So our friend Rod D, who used to go by the name Rod the Hop, who used to you know, be a professional card cheat uh, in Las Vegas uh, when I was a kid, he used to do it with chem cards. But you know, he had a crimp in the card and he had a couple high cards and he would do a pharaoh and all he had to do was get a few cards in the middle of the deck to be weaved, to go in between those two high cards, right? And then he would use his hop to bring the cards uh, up for dealing, right? So when you realize, uh, when we as magicians ask you to do perfect cuts and perfect shuffles, well, you're already doing something that a gambler wouldn't even have to do, wouldn't even try to do. It's just not even part of the deal, 
right? Plus we're doing it in our hands most of the time because otherwise we're just showing off. So I had some of our students have a lot of luck with the grip I use. I use a grip with an awful lot of control. So I start with the cards at my fingertips. My first finger is at my outer finger, at the out, outer end of the deck, the thumb and the second finger on either side of it, right? And when I take the deck, uh, the cards with the other hand, I'm putting my pinky at the back and my two fingers of my right hand are on the same side and it's pretty much opposite. The thumb is on the opposite spot. Now when I pull these cards apart, I'm going to do a quick squaring action and what I'm going to do is I'm going to realign everything. So as I do it on the left side, my thumb is going to slide down toward that corner. So I've got my first finger there. Notice as I slide my thumb, my fingers slide down so that they've got a lot of control. I'm leaving about an inch and a half of space there. And at the same time I'm doing that, I'm doing a similar thing on the left side. I'm sliding my thumb up to there's about a, an inch and a half of space. And I'm, these two fingers are spreading out too. So I'm doing my best to have both halves be real square. And I'm going to bring my first finger pretty close to the edge there. Part of that is that you can use that as a table. That first finger can be used as a table, right? And that's useful. But it's also going to be support for keeping the cards square. You see how the, you get those little nicks and things? Those can be potential problem spots. The reason I said in the, in the, in the explanation that reversing the cards was going to be no good when you're practicing is because those cards being reversed could really put a hiccup in your, in your Pharaoh. Another reason is that the, uh, the breather card itself, if you have it be too strong, that could be a hiccup in your Pharaoh. So I do a steeple thing here. I, I line them up so that they're even. And then I, I bevel them both against each other. So I'm keeping them loose enough in my hands that when I press up on them, they will, they will bevel. And so then I bevel them against each other like that, keeping my first finger to help. And then you literally just line up the bottom card exactly where you want it. and run them right up, right? Like so. So you'll notice that after you're practicing this, as you're practicing, you'll start to get a pretty good grasp pretty immediately. You'll look at the cards and go, oh yeah, got one too many over here. You'll get that as a natural benefit of practicing this for a few weeks. You don't even have to worry about that. You'll start to be able to see it. And once you learn how to line them up pretty well, well, once you know, you can look at them and see that they're the same. It's not hard to put the one on the bottom you want on the bottom. And if the one you want on the bottom is on the bottom, then that, that's going to dictate where the one at the top ends up. Does that make sense? You can actually see it and you put the one that you're going to want on. So if I'm going to do an in Pharaoh, I'm going to want this one to go in second. So it's going to go just above the bottom card, which is going to be on the right hand side like that. Right. Or vice versa. Now that I'm not saying it's super easy. It isn't, but I am saying that it does respond to practice. It does get a lot easier. And if you're going to be playing with Pharaoh tricks, I think you'll find that if you Pharaoh a deck, when you're opening it up and playing with it, you'll find it much more, malleable to farrowing when you need to farrow it in front of people. Honestly, I have to tell you guys, I think that was the best concise farrow teach we've ever done. It was pretty tight. I think you did that within like five minutes or so, maybe even a little, little less. But there was all the information there. Everything it's, was it's, there. Yeah. It's really about the grips to start. It's really about how those grips adjust, what those grips are for, and then how to actually be practicing it with a, a real chance that it's going to work.
right? Because I think if you try it with all those things we just said, you're going to make progress quickly. And over a few months, you'll find you make a lot of progress. Don't be surprised if it takes several months before those last couple errors start to disappear. You'll find for several months, you'll get, always get one or two errors and they'll always be in different places. And you'll loosen your grip. When you start to loosen your grip when you're doing all these things, that's when things just, and they just flutter right together and everything just works. So be patient with yourself. Right. And don't worry that that's not going to happen in the first couple of weeks. That'll happen after a month or two. Maybe longer. Be patient with yourself. <laughs> be patient with yourself, but I'm saying you'll be able to start to have the right pressure and then be able to loosen the pressure and keep it within a couple months. Yeah. And, and that's when you'll find it starts to make real progress. Okay. There are so many people that can do the Faro shuffle y'all as opposed to certain bottom deals and second deals and passes and things. There are so many people that can do a Faro shuffle. We just can tell you, it's just not that hard. That's it. And it becomes fun to practice too. That's the other thing, just like everything else, you know, the Faro shuffle is fun to do. And when you start to get in that groove, that's when it opens up on you.